Today's gospel reading shows Jesus telling his disciples how they must find their way after he is gone. He's telling it to them, but by extension, he's telling it to all of us as well. And in this moment, Jesus doesn't offer any rules other than love God, love your neighbor. Jesus doesn't offer any creeds, and Jesus doesn't offer any dogmas. All that stuff comes later, and it comes from other people. Jesus never even provides folks with like a theological system or a basic 411 of what the world is. None of that. Instead, just a bunch of parables and riddles and mysteries. Jesus says the Holy Spirit itself must be what guides us through the things that are to come. Well, if we consider ourselves to be believers of the way or followers of Jesus, or even if we just allow for the possibility that spirit is a real thing and not some intellectual metaphor for whatever they're teaching in seminary right now, if we allow for that, this should be really interesting to us because, of course, later on, the Christian church as a cultural institution the Christian church, as it was later made by the Roman Empire, it disregards this teaching. And we can get into that where and how they did. But they did. It's one of many that get left behind. But Jesus tells us how to navigate in his absence. And as his followers, to ignore him is to follow the path laid out by the empire that killed him. So I propose to you this morning, good morning, by the way, it's great to be here. <laughs> Howdy from Portland, Oregon, it's raining there, surprise. It's good to see you all. It's actually warmer there, though. Um, I propose to you this morning that the story of the Christian church, again, as an institution, as a big cultural beast, is the story of what happens to all of us when we don't know how to navigate, when we uh, it's what happens when our brains can no longer see the big picture of where we are and what we're doing and we're all alone in the dark and all we have is a little light that only shows us the next few steps. Christianity. And I don't mean to sound too hard on the early Christians because we are all in the same boat with them now. As everyone today living in our world knows, it can be terrifying to try to find your way in uncertain times where we have no clue what's coming down the road, right? No one knows. Our brains crave context and we want like strategic planning and a map built off reliable information, probably from experts who went into debt at seminary somewhere. Safe maps built off reliable information, but of course, the most terrifying of all spiritual truths is that no such maps exist. And if we allow for that, then we have to come to grips with the fact that we might be lost and we might be stuck. To my mind, every new mass shooting demonstrates that that's true, that we're lost. Every time a law enforcement person attacks a person of color, every act of war shows something's wrong. And I can try to personally distance myself from all these things and shut all the horrors of the world and say that someone else is doing them, not my church, not me as an individual, but as a Protestant Christian, I have to take responsibility for the fact that, um, that the modern world is my tradition's legacy. We built it. This was our doing, and now this, this is the world that we are all lost in, that we've been sitting around in churches saying, love your neighbor for a long time, and it has still led to a fractured future, to a strange cultural crisis of vision where all our individual maps have fallen into conflict with everyone else's maps. And I wonder if Jesus saw this coming. 
I wonder if this is part of the things that are to come that he knew we'd face. There are many ways of thinking about being lost and being stuck, but one of my favorites comes from a rabbi. I'm sick, I just got over a cold because I've got kids. They're nasty, petri dishes. So I'm gonna keep drinking. It's water. Uh, there's this rabbi Freeman, and he's a rabbi and he's a family systems therapist, but he has this pattern he describes called emotional, or excuse me, imaginative gridlock that we all get stuck in sometimes. It describes how a certain way of seeing things in the world gets really familiar to us emotionally and how from this, everything we do serves to reinforce that pattern. And from that, a whole cognitive world gets constructed all around us. And that's natural. It's just what we humans do. The difficulty comes that when we do get lost, we realize that our made-up world is closing us off from the actual world of other people. Then sometimes we get too scared to ever step out of our mental cultural prison. And this is one definition for Friedman of what spiritual sickness is. He doesn't call it sin or ignorance or samsara. He calls it instead, and I think we should, just to see it fresh for the few, next few minutes, imaginative gridlock. And Friedman says that you can know that this is happening, this gridlock thing. It always starts to manifest in people the same way. Life starts to seem like an unending treadmill of trying harder and harder, but you're never getting anywhere. That people start looking for better answers and miracle solutions and political saviors rather than daring to reframe the questions entirely. Being stuck in imaginative gridlock means uh, losing touch with the intuitive wisdom of your body, something that is smarter than our brains. And instead, our thinking slows and slips into simple dichotomies like good versus evil. Light versus dark, and of course, right versus left. It happens to all of us. We get stupid. We get stuck. Whole religions can get stuck. Whole societies can get stuck. But to help us plot a course through all this heady stuff today, I'd like to share an analogy from the world of nautical navigation. This also comes from Friedman, and he describes how, from a European perspective, my ancestors, that um, the so-called New World was first discovered at the end of the 15th century. And basically, all the tools and technology needed to get a boat from Europe to what we now call North America, all those things had been in place for hundreds and hundreds of years before anyone actually made the trip. This is, uh, uh, up until 1492, they had all the technology, but they couldn't put it together somehow. Now, why was that? To put it simply, once upon a time in Europe, if you had a boat and you wanted to try to get somewhere far away, what you did was you went out and you got to the, this is the traditional educated way to do it, you got information, you got authorities, you got maps of where you wanted to go and star charts, and you plotted the whole thing out through, I don't know, a sexton. This is what Christian professionals did back in the day. But because no one in the world of 15th century Europe had ever been to North America before, there were no charts or maps existing that could get you there. And because there were no charts or maps existing that could get you there, none of the professional, grown-up, responsible navigators could do the job. One by one by one, all the very best failed at it. Now, as we all know, back then, at this time, some people thought the world was flat, that you would just fall off the surface of reality if you went far enough. 
or at the very least, if they didn't think this, the existing maps as they extended further and further past where anyone had actually been before, they got murkier and vaguer and people, the map makers, just like we all do, started projecting their anxieties on all the things they couldn't see. So you'd see Kraken and dragons and Leviathan and they weren't there. But at the edges of our maps, things get a little crazy. In short, people of this era and the entire cultural world of Europe was stuck in imaginative gridlock, okay? But there is this other term, this other nautical term for another more reckless and dangerous way of navigating. And it's something that the Maori people of South Pacific had been doing forever, successfully. And by the way, they made it to North America long before the Europeans did. And this is called, it's also my favorite metaphor for the Holy Spirit. It's called dead reckoning. For your consideration, dead reckoning is the nautical term for the inner capacity for one to chart a course based off of one's own constant measurements rather than using someone else's maps. It's a kind of described by uh, one navigator as a kind of biofeedback with one's environment. And it's scary and it's risky. Now as history records him, Christopher Columbus was basically a monster, no matter how you cut it. Okay, no good side. He killed people, he enslaved people. We all have some Columbus bashing inside us, I'm sure. Um, but on top of that, he didn't know how to navigate using traditional means. He didn't even know how to use a sexton. And so ironically, it was his talent for navigating the way the Maori did that could get him somewhere using dead reckoning to get somewhere that none of the professional navigators of his day knew how to do. Now, we can define this practice of dead reckoning in emotional terms. It requires a strange mix of imagination and determination, but also this ability to perceive one's inner world correctly and a bold new relationship between risk and reality. Friedman uses this as a metaphor to describe how when all of us get stuck, this is the only way we can break free of our emotional ruts to discover a new territory, okay? Dead reckoning as a metaphor. But what does all that mean for us here on Madison Avenue <laughs> on Sunday morning? I propose to you that mainline Christianity is itself stuck in a kind of imaginative gridlock. And it's not a critique of this church or any other out there, but an honest recognition that a similar dynamic is now playing out across all our houses of worship in this country. Over the last few years, I've basically played consultant to churches, a lot of different kinds of churches, hundreds and hundreds, and so many of them express the same kinds of worldview concerns post-pandemic. And one way or the other, they feel stuck. And I've heard dozens of pastors tell me some version of um, that just holding on feels like an upward battle, and they're losing. <laughs> They can't keep doing it. Others will tell me that they see, all they see are injustices everywhere, that they have no ability to confront or match. But all of them say that their churches are slowly emptying out and they're not sure how long they can keep the lights on. None of their kids go to their churches. Now, what's true for whole communities might also be true for us as individuals as well. So maybe some of us feel stuck and lost. Lord knows I do sometimes. And if this is the case, you can think and plan and go to experts all you want. But as we all know, the problem with thinking and planning is it doesn't necessarily help you when you're stuck. When you're stuck, thinking and planning and experts only often perpetuate the same emotional patterns in new forms. To get unstuck, there has to be some kind of shift 
a radical break with the status quo, a willingness to step into dark parts of the world filled with Kraken and Leviathan and do the things that are impossible for us to do a few steps at a time. It's called having faith in the old days, trusting your insides, trusting that God speaks to me, to risk the dangers of being wrong in order to find out for ourselves whether or not there might actually be a Holy Spirit that can comfort and guide us if we listen for it. Now, here we approach one of the big insights that both Rabbi Friedman and, more importantly, Jesus of Nazareth offers us. Both suggest to us that the only way to break out of emotional gridlock or these sinful, stuck knots that we find ourselves in is to forgo our usual tendency toward the comforts of repetition, of dogmatic certainty, and someone else's maps. Jesus says in so many different ways, the only way for us to discover new and sacred realities is to let go of the maps that brought us here so far and maybe try out a new road or two. Some of them will work and some of them certainly won't, but this is how gridlocks get broken. And it isn't some cognitive power it's not about how smart we are or how educated we are, but it has everything to do with how much faith we have, with how willing we are to risk the emotional patterns we've become addicted to and venture into the unknown only led by the deep wisdom of our bodies. One of my uh, ministerial mentors used to say this thing. She said, action must precede reflection. And now I'm passing that sage wisdom on to all of you. I think it means that in order to uh, truly accept and confront the crisis of vision that is around us, we can no longer revert to repetitive victim and villain making. We could no longer keep repeating the old, simple, navel-gazing and helpless attitude of waiting for the same ideas that haven't worked this far to eventually play out and pan out for us. To grow in faith, we must act in faith. We must brave the wider darkness with only the little bit of light that we have. Before enlightenment is possible, before we can actually perceive the Holy Spirit as a real thing, just the way Jesus said we would, we must all learn to sacrifice our deadening and blinding safety zones because risk always precedes realization. So, <clears throat> I'll close here shortly. But today I'd like to leave you with the practice of dead reckoning. It reminds us that having faith is necessarily a blind and reckless adventure into uncharted territory. And it can be very terrifying, but it can also be very rewarding. And either it, whatever it is, on any given day, it's the only way we ever learn and grow outside of all the prisons we've created around ourselves. The only way that the path of God's love can still open up before us. Dead reckoning means making the way by walking it. And if our communities of faith are going to retain their spiritual relevancy and connection to the real world around us and still be viable places for the 21st century, we will have to understand that what is true for churches and for people is the same thing that's true for ships designed to sail the ocean. The safest place for them is in the harbor, but that's not why ships are built. Amen. <laughs>